All right, in this lecture, we're going to talk about a Petra matrices, a couple of the different matrices data structure, matrix data structures that are available within a Petra. Uh, briefly, we're going to speak about graphs and uh, also some of the extensions to a Petra, which is actually a separate package in itself, a Petra EXT. And of course, like the other vi videos in this series, these are all in, in the context of PyTrilinos. So there's a couple of matrix formats that are available to us. The first one is a serial dense matrix. And like its name implies, uh, serial implies that these are meant to be only used and operated on one processor. So they're not actually distributed data structures. Um, and it's essentially a, an Apetra interface to block, to BLOS, so the basic linear algebra services um, libraries that are pretty much standard on all computing platforms. And so this would be, uh, although they're not distributed, which may make you think that they're not useful to us in high performance computing or in a parallel setting, there's a lot of times where we want to do local on processor computations of the matrix form. Um, and, you know, a lot. This occurs a lot in, in solid mechanics, where you have, might have, say, stress tensors or strain tensors that are three by three matrices, and you want to manipulate them in some way. And, and of course, uh, also as the name implies, dense would imply a matrix of the format. So if you had a three by three, uh, a dense matrix would have entries in all of the locations, or nearly all of them. So you might have, you know, one zero. Um, but that zero is actually going to be stored as a value. Okay, so this is the uh, the serial dense matrix format. Okay, the next type is actually a distributed matrix, and this is going to be uh, what's called a column row sparse matrix. So in this type of matrix, uh, you would actually have well, first of all you would have the matrix be distributed across several processors. So that you might have this portion of the matrix on processor 0, this on 1, and this on 2. And then this, the structure of the matrix itself is going to be sparse so that uh, and th these type of matrices occur a lot in the types of physics problems we want to solve in engineering in finite element or finite difference calculations. So you have a, may have a matrix of the form that looks something like this, where most of the elements are zero. And we don't want, of course, if we can avoid it, we wouldn't want to store just a bunch of zeros that aren't going to be operated on in any way. So we can, we can store this. And kind of what the storage structure would look like, uh, uh, if this is a global row zero and global row one, then the storage structure would be something like entries in row zero or entries in column 0 and column 1. Row 1 would have entries in column 1. Then we move on to the next processor, which has the global, say, ID 2. And it would have entries in 1, comma 2. So this is the type of data structure uh, that is allocated. And then each of these would have values associated. So the actual value, th these are just indices locations, but the actual values could be something else. And that, that's what's stored in, in that type of matrix. So then the last type of matrix, oh, uh, by the way, there's also this FECRS matrix. Uh, that's a typo. It should, it should actually be CRS matrix available that has some additional features that make um, finite element type matrix assembly and operations a little bit more natural. Okay, um, And finally, there's this uh, VBR matrix type, which is a variable block row. So um, actually, as I've drawn this here, this also has a structure of a variable block row. So these would be where the, uh, the sparsity structure of the matrix are kind of grouped into blocks. So a regular CRS matrix could have you know, some sort of irregularity like this. Uh, but a, a variable block row matrix will not have that. It'll have the structure where you have sort of have these groups or blocks along any, anywhere along the matrix. But they are uh, variable in their location. And 
the, the, the difference or the reasoning for the different types of matrix format is you can actually, if you truly have this type of uh, structure in your matrix, um, you can actually, using certain solvers, get quite a bit of performance gain over just a regular CRS matrix in, in the way that they're solved. And either of these methods will have typically have a massive performance gain uh, when combined with special solvers over, over a dense matrix class. So here's an example of a, of a dense matrix um, and, and how you would actually allocate them in, in Pi Trilino. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is allocate an empty 3x3 three three, uh, dense matrix and then we're going to fill it with random numbers. And then in the second way we're going to actually allocate the matrix, again a 3x3, three three, but this time we're going to put in a Python list uh, as you can see. So it's just basically on the first row, one, two, three, second row, four, five, six, third row, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And then finally, the third, the third um, way we're going to allocate or instantiate this serial dense matrix class is to instantiate it with another matrix. So we're basically in this way going to copy the structure of matrix one uh, for matrix three and then what this basically, what this operation here does is it says that matrix 3 is going to be equal to matrix 1 times matrix 2. So matrix 1 is getting operated on by multiplication with matrix 2 and the result is stored in matrix 3. And so if we actually run this code uh, this is this is the result you'd get. Now, in this case, there's no reason to run this in parallel because you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't see anything different. This this is a serial uh, matrix class, so it would only this operation would only be performed on one one processor. These these types of matrices cannot be distributed. So then, an example of uh, of a CRS matrix would be uh, like this. So here. Uh, we're going to start with saying, defining how many rows we would like to have for this matrix. I've said nine. And we're going to allocate a map. Now this is a standard kind of distributed map. So the number of rows are going to be evenly distributed across all processors. And here's where we instantiate the matrix. So the matrix is A. Um, and it's going to be distributed according to the standard map. And it's going to have three non-zero values per row. Now there are other ways to instantiate this matrices and of course you know the, the documentation is all online so I'm not the purpose of these notes are just to introduce you to some of these concepts and let you know the types of things that are available give you some hints but not to basically reproduce all of the documentation that's online. So there are other ways to construct this where say if you didn't have a constant number three per row or the the, the uh, um, the sparsity pattern was distributed in some irregular way. Okay, so then we're going to fill the matrix, and so that's what this for loop here is. And so basically, we're saying for the global IDs uh, on each processor that because so the standard map my global elements function will return the global elements on each processor. So this for loop will be running individually on each processor. And there's just a conditional statement that says if the global ID is either zero, it's the first one, or it's the last one, the number of rows minus one, then we just want to put a one on the diagonal. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to put this this pattern along the diagonal and the the one above the diagonal, one below the diagonal. So what this amounts to is sort of a central difference operator. So the, the way this matrix is going to look is 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1, dot, 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 to where then you have 1 in the last row. Okay? So when we call fill complete on this matrix, it optimizes the storage. So when we instantiated this matrix, we didn't specify an exact row and column map or the exact sparsity pattern of the row and the column. And so when we did this type of fill operation, 
you notice we inserted by the global values and so it sort of restructured the matrix on the fly and when we call fill complete it freezes the sparsity pattern of this matrix so we can change these values from now on but we can't put in different, so we couldn't come in later after we call fill complete. We couldn't come in later and say, you know, put a three over here in this location. The sparsity pattern of the matrix is frozen after fill complete is called, but we could change the individual values. So we could come in later and replace this two with, say, a four. Okay? So then in the final p uh, part of this code, we're just going to instantiate two petra vectors according to the same map. Uh, one of the vectors, B, we're going to just put scalars, so it's just going to be a vector 1, 1, 1, 1, you know, all the way down. The size is going to be 9. And then we can call this multiply operation. So finally we're going to uh, multiply A, okay, by B and return the value in X. And this false just means uh, use the regular matrix, don't use this transpose. So if you wanted to set that to true, what you would get is actually A transpose B. And so again, we're just getting this A times B being returned in X, okay? So for this one, I'd like to go quickly to the command terminal just to show you a couple of more things. So if I actually run this, and I'm just gonna run it in serial, so that I can interact with it, but if I use this code, I'm sorry, uh, that's just the result of the, the matrix multiplication, but I'm going to throw an I in there so that I can actually interact with it. And I just want to show you that, um, you know, if we just print out A, you'll get some kind of nonsensical uh, Pytrolinos, you know, uh, object information, but not actually any information that's useful. But what we can do is we can index into that array, and that will return NumPy arrays that are useful. So say the first, or the, the one index row, which is actually the second row, right? So if I go through and I print out each row, and I could do that for i in num rows a i. I'm sorry, in range num rows print a i. There you can see what the whole matrix looks like. Okay, so it's just like I said it was. Uh, and we can also index directly into a single value. So we could say um, z uh, a zero zero, right, that's going to return one. And we can reset that to something. So let's say we want to set it to 99, right? And then if we go to our for loop again, you'll see that the first one has been reset to 99, okay? So, uh, by the way, I, I, let me see if uh, I can show you what I was speaking about, that the matrix is frozen. So if I go to the first row, say, seventh column, and try to set that to something, let's see what happens. You'll notice that it hasn't changed. It prints out the zeros, but we don't even have access to that seventh column. It doesn't really exist in the structure of the matrix. So if I try to set it to the value, um, nothing happens, okay? And so that's what I meant. The, the structure of the matrix has changed, I mean, is, is frozen, uh, but we can change values that, that uh, are, you know, allocated indices. So there, there's not an example for the BVR matrix because the way you operate with them is basically the same, okay? So I just want to talk briefly about graphs. Um, so in, this, in the setting of matrices, graphs are mathematical constructs that describe the connectivity or sparsity pattern of the matrix. And I actually already sort of mathematically drew a graph 
Uh, this, this type of ind indice notation would be one way to describe the sparsity pattern or the graph of the matrix. A lot of times graphs are represented pictorially, and let me give you an example of that. So if you had, say, a one-dimensional bar, and say you were going to discretize it to do some finite element or finite difference calculations, and maybe the node numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If we want to describe the connectivity, then what we could say is that 1 is connected to 2, and 2 is connected to 3, and 3 is connected to 4, and 4 is connected to 5, and 5 is connected to 6. So this would be a pictorial representation of the, of the graph of this one-dimensional bar. And so where they're useful is we can actually do something called graph coloring. Um, so we can assign every set of nodes that aren't connected in any way. So like 1 is cannot, not connected to 3 in any way directly. Uh, 3 is not connected to 5 or 1, obviously. Um, then we can come back and so those are in the color blue. Then I can come back and say that 2, um, 4 are not connected in any way, and 4 and 6 are not connected in any way. And so then we can come back and assign each color a numerical value. So blue could be 0 and 1. So this graph would be of color 2, um, or more specifically, the distance 1 color of the graph would be of color two, so you could have things, concepts like distance two graphs, which would, you know, any any matrix or uh, any two nodes that are connected by two legs of the graph. So in this case, one and three would, would not be in the same color because you can take two steps along the legs of the graph to get there. Um, so you can also have, you know, higher order or higher distance graphs. But anyway, uh, these are concepts, uh, this is the kind of concept of graph coloring. And that can be useful in, in some types of uh, computations that we use, very specifically in trying to do finite difference approximations of, um, uh, you know, uh, of gradients or something where you get, might get like a tangent stiffness matrices or something like that. We can actually get very, very um, huge performance gains by coloring the graph first and then going through it. But, but the actual details of that are sort of outside the context of this lecture and, and even this class. But I just wanted you to be aware of it because uh, those graph coloring operations are actually in a Petra EXT, which we're going to talk about next. Okay. Uh, another advantage is if you know the graph, and a lot of times we know the graph because we, we read in the discretization from outside. So we have some finite element mesh that may be pre-meshed with a preprocessor, and we read that into our code. Well, the connectivity of that mesh will give us some information that we can use to construct a graph directly. And if we do that, we can use the graph to construct the CRS matrix. And the benefit of that is that once, the, once we have uh, constructed the graph, um, when we construct the matrix from the graph, the sparsity pattern is already fixed, and we can fill it with values much more efficiently than if we do what we did previously uh, in this example where we, we use this piece of code here uh, inside the for loop to construct the on the fly and then called fill complete later. This is much less efficient than if we were, if we knew the sparsity pattern up front, we construct a graph and use the graph to construct a matrix, then we can fill that matrix much more efficiently. Okay, and so that was my second comment here about uh, using using the graph to construct a matrix. And we can also uh, access a matrix's graph, one that's already had fill complete called on it, uh, with the method graph, okay? So I'm sorry about the, the writing there that's filling it up, but filling up the screen. But basically, if we have a matrix A that's already been fill complete, it's already been called upon it, then we can access its graph with that function. So, a Petra EXT is actually a package into of itself. Um, it's, it's a separate package from a, pe a Petra, and uh, it offers a few more things than what I've had listed here, but these are probably the main things that we'd like to use. Uh, again, 
graph coloring algorithms, which I already spoke about, you know, what a graph coloring means. Also matrix matrix functions. So uh, as part of the core of a Petra, we can multiply matrix by vectors or Petra vectors, but we don't uh, multiply matrices by matrices in any way. And so we can actually uh, use some Petra EXT functionality for that to add or multiply two matrices together. And we can also do some parallel I.O. So we can, you know, we can read from uh, a matrix from a MATLAB or a matrix market file, and we can write to MATLAB or matrix market files. And that's actually done in serial, not, not in parallel. Um, but uh, there's some other functionality uh, to write to, say, HDF5 or XML formats, and I believe that can be done in parallel. So the final example here is from Apetra EXT, and it's important to note Apetra EXT is its own package, so we've imported it by itself. So you notice we import Apetra, and then we also import Apetra EXT. And so the first part of this example is identical to the previous one. We're going to construct a matrix A uh, with that sort of uh, finite difference type operation. But now we're going to assess the graph of A. So with this function, we're going to and set it to a variable uh, graph of A. And we're going to use the graph of A to construct two new matrices. So B and C will be constructed with the graph of A. So these matrices will have the same identical sparsity pattern as A, and they've already had fill complete called upon them. So then we can use this method put scalar to fill B with two. So basically, you know, what we're going to get is two, 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 dot, 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 two. All right, because it has the same sparsity pattern as A, um, and, and then we're just going to fill it with two, so put scalar two, okay? And then we can use an Apetra EXT function to uh, multiply A and B. These falses, again, have the same kind of uh, transpose or not transpose. So if they're set to false, that means don't use the transpose. You just use A. B, just use B. And fill it uh, with C. So, so what we're going to have here is C equals A times B. Okay. And then the final line uh, is going to write out the row matrix to a, a MATLAB file. So uh, there we're going to the text file will be matrix.mat, and it will be of the form C. So let's go ahead and quickly run this to see what it looks like. So it's a little bit hard to show you what the matrix uh, format looks like. So if I just go ahead and run this uh, Petra EXT example, you'll see that there's a file, matrix.mat, that's been uh, written there, and there's the the output of it. So you see uh, the, the 1, 1 entry is 2, the 2, 1 entry is 2, the 2, 2 entry is 2. And you go have to go on down to you see eventually some other values due to the multiplication. But this is how you'd use a Petra EXT to both do a matrix multiplication and to write to a file. So this concludes this lecture.